coming into the house of God. And I love coming into this particular house, not just because Debbie and I were part of building it, but I love coming into this house because it's always been and it always will be a full gospel church. For some of you that don't know what that means, it's very important that you do know what that means. There's a lot of great churches, and in a moment we'll pray for them. And we have no illusion that we're better than anybody else. But a full gospel church is a church that believes that the gifts are for today. Many will, churches will use an excuse that they're not for today. When the apostles died, these gifts went out, and we don't use them today. That's like saying God isn't God today. He was God then, but not now. I love what Paul says. I haven't come to you with persuasive words of men, but I've come to you with the power of God. And we need to be a church that believes in the power of God. We need to be a church always that believes that the Spirit of God in this house can do whatever he wants to do, even disrupt our organized and intellectual thinking. I love Paul because when I study Paul, I find a man who's full of wisdom because he was incredibly intelligent, incredibly highly educated and intelligent, but in his intelligence, he did not throw out his spirit. There's many people in their intelligence that throw out the spirit, and then they wonder why their churches are impotent, and they don't get the job done. Here at The Rock, you'll find that you can come and get healed and get saved, have marriages mended. We believe God for great things, and children to get back in line, and what you couldn't do before, you'll end up doing, and what you couldn't achieve before because of the power of God that's in this place. Not because of a man. Not because we put on a show. Paul was wise because he was so smart, but he didn't throw out his spirit. But he was so spiritual, he didn't throw out his mind either. You might call that balance, but I don't. I call it maturity. That's the way we should be. It's a mature group of people that realize that God didn't give us a brain to throw it out and be crazy. And tonight, we're going to pray for the sick and believe God for healing. But it's not some, if you will, some, some goofy man in front of you that's standing here and his special anointing is going to get you healed. God is the healer. Always has been, always will be. And we have... In American churches become very superstitious about things. And we start believing in things instead of God for our future. We start bowing down to idols and statues that may have crumbling in their eyes or some form and make it so it's the so-and-so crying that we have millions of people coming to get healed or go to a fountain of youth. Cut it out. That'll just make you a suspicious person. We're going to see where God heals through men, but it's God that does the healing. And he uses strange things oftentimes to bring healing to his people. Why? Because God loves his people more than you and I will ever love the people. God loves the people. And he wants to heal you. And some of you in here tonight really desire that, but in order for it to happen, I found out early that you're going to have to play a part also, and that part is you need to touch his goodness. There's a goodness inside of God that comes out through mercy and kindness and love. For his people. And when you touch that goodness, you get healed. I don't expect everybody to get healed tonight that's going to ask for healing. God doesn't work that way. But I remember one story that uh, my friend 
Dr. Baron Gilfillan, who worked with Reinhard Bonnke for years as his right-hand man. Some of you may not know who Reinhard Bonnke is. He's a German evangelist to Africa, one of the greatest evangelists the world has ever known, much greater around the world than even Billy Graham was to America. He would have up to one half million people in one meeting and they would get healed. God spoke to him before the service one night with a half a million people and said, I want you to pray for the blind tonight. It's not an easy assignment to go stand in front of people. And if you're not a full gospel person, can I tell you something? There's no way in the world you'll ever do that. So God, you could ask it, but I'm not going to do it. And that's where most people are at because they don't believe that God wants to do things. And he told this evangelist, Reinhard Bonnke, to go pray for the blind. And in that service that night, about 50 blind people came forward that had never seen before. Never. And he prayed. And he asked God to drop on them. And five people out of the 50 got completely healed and saw for the first time in their life. Forty-five didn't get touched. I don't know why. Nobody does. That's God's business. Discouraged as he was afterwards, he went back and talked to God. He said, God, why did the other 45 not get healed? And God spoke these words, and I've never forgot them because Reinhardt told me himself. He said, if I didn't pray, God said this, if you didn't pray for the sick, five wouldn't have even gotten healed. Let me tell you something. That's what this church is all about. There's a lot of great churches out there, but you're not going to get healed. Just because they're not ever going to follow or, nor believe God that healing is for today. We believe God's going to heal some people today in this place yeah. with evidence that you're going to make a testimony about it. There's some that aren't going to get healed. They're going to get healed tomorrow when you get out of bed or next week or next month or next year because there's a season for everything. And I don't know what it is that God has planned for you individually, but I know one thing about God. He's not a slot machine in the sky that we can go make our petitions and instantaneously we get results. Let me tell you something. If we don't get results, God, then heck with you. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And he knows that kind of a heart. And most likely he'll just say, go ahead, have nothing to do with me. It's your benefit that I've come for you. And it's your call whether you have something to do with me or not. And sometimes because God doesn't move when we want, way we want, how we want, we give up on God. And that, my friends, is just wrong. If you're going to believe God tonight, then you've got to believe God until the day that you step off this earth and the last breath you take, because God's going to heal you if you believe God for it. But I don't know when it's going to happen. And I'd be a fool to stand before you and try to be something that I'm not. We develop a big, you know, superstitious church that chases after weird things. Let's don't throw our brains out because we're spiritual people. Let's don't do that tonight. Let's don't get weird. Why can't God heal and it not be a bunch of weirdos acting like they're super spiritual? Why don't we just let God, here's a novel statement. Why don't we just let God be God? Because you haven't come into this place to meet up with me. And you haven't come into this place to meet up with Pastor Dan or anybody else. You're in this place because tonight and every time you come to church, you want to meet up with God. I don't know about you, I need him to touch me. But I also need, listen to this, I need to reach out and touch him. And a lot of times we don't do that. 
We say ourselves in church, here we are, God, touch me. Like he's a monkey on a string. And we take that little string and we pull it and he, you know, he's going to dance to our tunes. God, touch me. God says, no, you believe me enough to touch me. And man, that's what I found that people get healed. I remember one time God said, will you dance for me? I said, Lord, I was a young man. I wasn't about to dance for anybody, especially in a church. You got to be kidding me. I said, Lord, I, I'm not, I don't think that's me. Or I'm not going to do that. I'm just, I haven't thrown that part of my brain out yet. And it wasn't long after that, he said, will you dance for me? And I said, Lord, no, I'm not going to do it. And um, I never did for years. And God asked me one time years later, will you raise your hands for me? Uh, sure, God. <laughs> and that's about it for me. I mean, I, that's where I was with God. And he says, no, I, I want you to raise your hands and surrender to me. And I said, Lord, I, I have a hard time doing that. You know, I had a hard time doing it. I finally got my hands up and I could feel his presence where with my heart, because of my action, I touched him. Is anybody listening? I remember God said to me one time, he says, this is a young man. He says, will you pray for the sick? I said, Lord, not a chance. I remember praying for somebody who was my friend and they died. I'm not interested in killing your whole church. I'm not going to pray for the sick. And then I remember him asking me again, will you pray for the sick? I said, Lord, I believe in you. He says, then will you pray for the sick? And I said, yes, Lord, I, I will. But I won't sing. He says, I won't ask you to sing. And I've been very grateful, but I love praying for the sick ever since then. Sometimes when we get out of ourselves and do what he wants, that's when the touching of him becomes real. Yeah. Let me say it again. Sometimes when we get out of who we are, our mode, our thinking, our spiritual depth or height that we can go to but no further, and we get out and we do something beyond <clears throat> ourselves, just to him and for him is when touching him becomes important. I think back over the life of so many scriptures of, of great saints of God like Abraham and his son Isaac. It was something that God asked him to do is to take up his son, his only begotten son and offer it to him as a burnt offering. A burnt offering means you take your son and you put him on a pile of rocks with sticks underneath the rocks and you stick a knife in him and you take him and you gut him like you would a sheep. The blood goes all over, you catch the wood on fire and it burns up. It's called a burnt offering because it literally cremates, makes it to nothing. And if I was asked that, I would have said to God, forget it. I'm not going to do that to my Jessica or my Luke or my Kimmy or my Miranda. You have to find somebody else to do it. But it was so important to see that Abraham didn't hesitate when God asked him to do it. And he goes up onto the mountain and he starts to offer up his son. And as he's raising his knife to his teenage probably son to kill him, because he did not know that our God he was the first Hebrew on the planet. He did not know that our God did not receive human sacrifice. He came out of a cult that gave human sacrifice. It was very common in his thinking. And he's ready to do what he knew from the past when God stopped him and said, now I know. And then God blessed him. 
two times in the next few verses. Why? Because here you see Abraham touching God. Not just God touching Abraham. And sometimes we want God to heal us, my friends. And we want him to touch us. And we've come because we want God to do that. But sometimes it's going to have to be you getting out of yourself and wanting him so much that you get out of yourself and touch him. And how do you do that nowadays except with your heart? Because that's what he's looking for. It's like the sick when they came to Jesus and they cried out, have mercy on us. They didn't even know who he was. They knew he was the son of David. And God healed them, bang! Just because they cried and touched with their compassion, he was touched with compassion and he felt them. Have you ever felt somebody that's hurting and you felt for them? You have just touched them in your heart. And when you touch God, miracles take place. And so many people don't understand that. They come to a church service like this and they say, well, I'll go. I'll sing songs and I'll give my $25 or $5 or nothing. And I'll sit here and if God touches me, praise God. Then I'll I'll serve him. Then I'll give him all of my heart. Then I'll give him all of my life. And it doesn't work that way. It's when... You get out of yourself and touch him. He makes this statement in scripture, if you'll draw near to me, God says, I'll draw near to you. But guess who draws near first? You have to draw near to him. Then he draws near to you. Does he draw near to you and then you draw near to him? No. That's like sitting in front of the fireplace saying, give me heat, then I'll put in the wood. It doesn't work that way. You put in the wood, you light the fire, and then you get heat from the fire. Why? Because you lit it. You touched it. You did it. The Bible makes it very clear that faith without works, it's you touching God with your heart tonight. That when you walk out of here tonight, things are going to happen in your life. Before I go any further and get into the scripture, I want you to know that right after, I want to get into the scripture and I want to pray for sick right after I get into the scripture. But there's always an altar call in this church. There's always an opportunity for people to get saved and get right. You don't come to the rock, any of our service, like we have nine services a week, if you count all the services that are going on, not including the 40 some odd services that we have in children's ministry. This place is really busy every week. That's not including the 3,000 children that come to church here every week and the probably hundreds, almost 1,000 young people like high school and junior high school that come to church here. But each time there's going to be an altar call at every level because some of you need and want healing tonight, but you're going to have to do something beyond yourself you're going to have to now do something you don't want to do. You're going to have to be like Abraham and go up to the top of the mountain. Or you're going to have to be like me, get past the things that I didn't want to do. I remember when God said, will you cry out to me and say to me, I love you, Jesus. (laughs) Wait a minute. I'm a man. I'm having a real hard time saying I love you, Jesus, publicly. He says, will you? I did. I touched him and he blessed me. Some of you in here need to get right with God. You know, you've been messing around, fooling around. If you died right now, you're not even sure you'd go to heaven. In fact, You think because you're in this church service, that would get you in heaven, nothing further from the truth. You can't get to heaven because you go to church, 
You can't get to heaven because you're the pastor. Can you imagine that? You can't get to heaven because you're cool or smart or your mom and dad told you you were a Christian. You can't get to heaven because you think and you know who Jesus is. Hello? Everybody knows who Jesus is. The devil knows who Jesus is. Is he going to go to heaven? No. It's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you do tonight, right now, with your heart. Some of you need deliverance in your life. It's coming tonight. Some of you need your minds to open up and get the strategy of real life. It's coming tonight. Some of you have fallen behind so far that only God could bring you forward and get you going back on track. Tonight is your night. But you need to get right with God and I'm gonna pray with you right where you're at. Nothing could get more simple than this. That right in your seat, I will lead you in a prayer before we get into the scripture, before we pray for the sick, of salvation that you can receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. You say, well, how do I know that's me? If you just wanna pray and I'll follow you, I'll be in my seat. No, I want you to make a public statement. I want you to acknowledge that you want me to pray for you for salvation so you could go to heaven. Hold on, we'll do it all, all at the same time. Hands are already going up. What I mean by that is in a moment I will ask you Give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. That's what you're doing with this prayer. You're making him the boss of the rest of your life. <clears throat> it's no longer you controlling it, it's him. You give control of your life to Jesus Christ. That's what lordship is all about. Make him Lord and savior. He's not only my savior, you can't make him savior without making him your Lord. You can't make him Lord without making him your savior. It's just as simple as that. And tonight, I want to make sure that everybody in here is, first of all, the greatest healing there is, is called this word salvation. In the word salvation is the word physical healing. A lot of times people don't know that. They say healing is today, way back. If you're getting saved in that word salvation, in the original text is the word physical healing healing physical healing starts when you give God all of your life and all of your heart that's what it's all about we're not going any further until you do what you know you need to do and give God all your heart and all your life we're going to pray and as I pray you want me to pray for you you want to be part of that prayer you want to be born again headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell, then you're gonna in a moment get your hand up. I'll count it, you put it right back down, it's simple as that. You're gonna hear this sound, one, two, three, bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. When I see your hand, I'll count it, you put it back down, and then we'll pray. That's the public statement. Do you know why? Because Jesus said, Jesus said, listen, Jesus said, not me. Jesus said, this is a Bible-believing church. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. That's what he said. But if you deny me when you need to confess me, I'll deny you when you get before the Father. And you don't want that. So all across this auditorium tonight, I want you to get ready to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. And we'll all pray together, no embarrassment whatsoever, but you're gonna have to get your hand up and say, count me in. I wanna go to heaven and I don't wanna go to hell, include me in the prayer. I'm counting right now. Who should raise your hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? If you've never given him all of your heart, you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, get past your brain and go to your heart and make sure. Tonight is your night of salvation. 
All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, I'm watching you also. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Thank you. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, to one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. Thank you. Twenty-six back over here. Twenty-seven. Thank you. Twenty-eight. Thank you back there. Twenty-nine. Thank you. Thirty. Thank you back there. Anybody else? <clears throat> Anybody else? Thirty-one. Thirty-two. Thirty-three. Thank you. God bless you. 33 people, if there's 33, don't you know there's two more? There, I just feel you, 34 and 35. Where are you? Get your hand up, you know you need to. Stop messing with God. Where are you, 34? Where, where are you, 30? Wave it at me, because they're pointing down. There's somebody over this way. Everybody's waving that way. Wait, oh, 34, 35, gotcha. God bless you, God bless you. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. All right, everybody stand with me just for a minute. Let's go before the Lord and let's pray. Father, everybody say these words. Father, Father the, greatest the greatest gift there is, there is, is given me the gift of salvation. I receive it now and forever in Jesus' name. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten son. I believe you sent him for me. I believe he died for me. I believe you raised him from the dead just for me. Thank you, Jesus. I'm born again. I'm alive. I'm free. I'm headed for heaven. I've got the victory. Now give the Lord a great big <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Now, right after church, I'll tell you about my friend Stephen. He has a free book to give every one of you that raised your hands. You might as well get at least 30 or 35 of them. And we'll, we'll get you, Steve. And they can get, just on their way out, hand them a book, okay? And tell them you got to get back to church. Okay, everybody sit down. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's, let's do this. Very, very important for us. <clears throat> In Mark, if you want to get your Bible out, you know, if you, you know, if you come to church, if you don't have a Bible, my goodness, we'll give you a Bible. Start bringing your Bible to church. This is a Bible-believing church, a Bible teach. You know, which is really very funny because there's so many people that say, I'm not sure I believe in the Bible. Then it's over with. Our communication's over with. Because there's nothing I can do to get you to believe anything if you can't believe the Bible. The Bible is the Bible. It's been around for thousands of years. It's proved itself thousands upon tens of thousands, millions of times at the cost of great expense of people's lives so you can have what God says sitting on your lap and see it for yourself. Someone said to me, let's debate about God. My question is, do you believe in the Bible? Then I'll debate with you because I have no other reference other than what the Bible says. I happen to be dumb like Billy Graham. If he said it, I believe it. That settles it. I'm not going somewhere to try to find out how to make it work. I know how it works. This is God's love letter to all of us. If we apply it in our lives, we prosper. If you don't know what to do about your home, family, marriage, destiny, future, business, whatever it is, based on the word of God and how to live this life, you will live less than you are able, could have lived. And you could have lived a whole lot more if you just functioned according to what God says instead of functioning according to what you say or your parents or politicians tell you. So the Bible is very important and it gives us insight into Jesus and insight into the heart of God. So I want to take you, if I may, into, if you'll go with me to the Mark in the sixth chapter. Could you put the title up one more time? Very important. I want everybody to get this title before we go to open up. Is touching his goodness. That's what we're going to see tonight. 
is that when you touch his goodness, he touches you with that goodness. And it's so important for us to see. If you will, in Mark, the sixth chapter, last verse in Mark, the sixth chapter, verse number 56. I'll read it to you and then I'll put it up. It says, wherever he entered, speaking notice capital H in the word he, meaning Jesus, entered into village cities and countries. They laid the sick in marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole or were made well or were healed. Let's take a look at this just for a moment because a lot of it is talking about you. Everyone in here that wants to get healed about something, this is how you're going to do it. It says, wherever he, have you ever thought those funny words, wherever he, you're going to have to go after God. And the guy that sat back in the village and said, oh, the heck with that. You know, God's there. That's why church is so important. You're going to find out oftentimes watching reruns of, you know, of some dumb story on television isn't going to help you a bit. But if you'll get off the couch and get into church, even though it's hard to do on Wednesdays and Sunday nights and so on, you'll find yourself where you're in that place where he's at. He's in his churches at that time. They entered into the village and city of the county and they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him. I love their attitude right off the bat. They weren't just saying, I'm here, whatever. Do what you want to do. Maybe you'll heal me. I'm kind of coming just to see if it's going to happen. They had an attitude that said, man, I need you, God. Just like the leper would cry out, just like the blind would cry out to Jesus and say, mercy, mercy. Mercy. I wonder how many of us, if we were in a public place, we knew Jesus was there, we would run to him and cry, mercy, and be the spectacle of everybody. We wouldn't. We're too, you know, we're, we think of ourselves, we're too cool to do that. But it's the ones that were there that begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. They didn't say, Jesus, touch me. Here we see they are touching the hem of his garment. How many of you would like to have that garment in front of you right now that are sick so you could just touch that garment? Let me tell you something. If you waved at me and said yes, like some of our pastors just did, that's the stupidest thing you ever want to do. When I ask a question like that, don't move. Here's the reason why. Because the healing's not in the garment. If the healing's in the garment, then all of a sudden what we do is we become people who spend the rest of our life trying to find the shroud of the tarrant or, or try to come up with something or come up with something that was God's that I could touch it. Some kind of obstacles of God. And if I touch it or partake of it, I'll have eternal life or I'll have, I'll have healing. Let me tell you something. It wasn't in his garment. It was in the anointing. It was in his presence. It was the man. And oftentimes we're looking for something else other than him to heal us. Is anybody listening to me tonight? And so many times we'll read that and say, wow. If they just, sure they touched, because the garment represented something. What he wore was a kingly, priestly robe that was made and woven very well. In fact, it was worth so much that even the Roman soldiers gambled to try to get the material when they crucified him on the cross at the base of the cross. It wasn't in that garment and yet the church today still doesn't have an understanding. They wish they could do anything they could to touch that garment. It's not the garment you touch. It's the Christ that's in the garment that you touch. Is anybody listening? The garment only represented his office or his place. It's the man who carries the anointing. Is anybody listening to me now? And sometimes we so easily overlook things like that. 
And as many as touched him, did they touch him? You bet. Because their faith was there. And God, what is he saying? He says, I love my people. I'll do whatever I need to do to get them healed. I'll touch that garment. It's just not the garment. We need to go past the garment and go to the Christ, the Son of God, where the anointing and the power of God is. And it's in that that they got healed. And all of them, they touched him, not, notice how it says they didn't touch just the garment, but they touched him. It's very important that you see this. It says, as many as touched him were made well. How'd they touch him? By touching the garment. But it wasn't the garment, it was him that healed him. Yeah. You, did you see that? Yeah. While you're there, in, in the Gospels, go with me, if you will, into Luke, the sixth chapter. In Luke, take a look at the sixth chapter of Luke. It's kind of powerful. I love this. In fact, let's look at Luke, the sixth chapter, verse number 17. And it says, and he came down with them and he stood on a level. Notice the capital H there on the word he, meaning Jesus. And he came down and stood with them in a level place with a crowd uh, of his, with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. How many of you have come to hear about Jesus tonight and want to get healed of whatever problems are in your life? Come on, don't, don't be afraid. Raise your hand. That's what this is all about. You're there. Verse number, if you will, 18. As well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him. For power went out from him and healed them. Have you ever thought about coming to church to touch God instead of God touching you? Because you touch God first and then he'll touch you. And a lot of times we come to church we want them to emotionally move us. They wanna, we want to be entertained by them. We want to be, you know, we want to be starstruck by what the activity is of the church or the greatness of the preacher or the funny jokes that are being done or the delight of all of that. And all of it's wonderful. And I'm not putting it down. I love the smoke and the lights and all of that. But when we become a church that entertains instead of a church that teaches the people to touch the heart of God, then we have a church that's impotent. And we're learning how important it is to see that we touch him, not just him touching us. And if we're gonna be touched by him, we have to touch him two times first. Is anybody listening? One of the things Deborah and I have done all of our life, oh God, is we were so broken and so nothing, so inadequate for what our dream was that was set before us that we saw. We'd get together and in our morning times we would touch him. Oftentimes we didn't just touch him in prayer. We, we touched him just with our heart. You can touch him with your heart when you're driving your car down the freeway. I mean, how many times have I been driving my car down the freeway and I'm just snotting all over the place and crying because I'm touching him? And in return, he's touching me back. You can touch him anytime, any place, anywhere. And it ought to be that we touch him at least in church. Instead of him just waiting for him to touch us. Whew. While you're there in Luke the sixth chapter, go with me to the eighth chapter. Luke the eighth chapter. I'll read you this story. You already know it, but it's such an interesting story. Started in verse number 43 of the eighth chapter of Luke. 
Now a woman having a flow of blood, I, I don't know what that is. I, I imagine that her menstrual time was continuous, never stopped. I know that's an uncomfortable subject to talk about publicly. I know that it's not something anybody wants to even think about. But for a moment, get past your own feelings and stop and think, especially the women who understand this woman. If it flowed for 12 years nonstop, how would you feel? Who had spent all of her livelihood, all of her money, everything she had on physicians and could not heal, be healed by any. Verse 44. Came from behind and touched the border of his garment. Speaking of Jesus, notice the capital H on the word his. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. She touched God first. Let me ask you something. I was talking to someone recently. They said, you know, we think we're not going to come to church anymore because our biggest fights are when right before church. We fight in the car. We fight while we're getting dressed. Who needs that? We get along fine except when we come to church. And I thought to myself, what a stupid statement and how stupid and ignorant you must be to realize that the devil doesn't want you to come in. No wonder you're fighting. Because when you come here and you get touched by him, you will leave never the same. But what we need to do is have a time when we touch him, listen to me now, before we come to church. That's why there's so much fighting before we come to church. Not just to keep us out, but to keep us from touching him. Because remember, when you touch him first, then he what touches you. And can you imagine a people that walk into a building or drive onto the parking lot and they've already touched God. And then they gather together and he touches them. Now you have something called revival. Revival means the dead wake up. The city comes alive. And you say, Pastor, are you strange? Of course I'm strange. I've touched him and he's touched me. And ever since I touched him and he touched me, I've never been the same. I am absolutely lost to the world. But here's the best part. I don't give a flip what the world has to say. I've never been happier. I've never been filled. I've never been with more destiny. Why? Because I touched him and he touched me. Come on, somebody. So she comes up behind him in this crowd and she just reaches down. She has to be low to touch the hem of his garment down at the bottom. So she's down on the ground as it goes by. She doesn't even have enough confidence to stand. Hey, hey, I'm Sally. Can you lay your hands on me and heal me? She doesn't do that. She's in such a subordinate position almost a beggarly, remember we heard the word begging? A beggarly position that comes before deity, creator of the heavens and earth, and as his sweeping garment goes by, she touches it. And for 12 years, that which flowed stopped instantaneously. The verses go on and they're kind of fascinating. Now watch this. Touch the hem of his garment. It says in verse number 40, immediately the flow of blood stopped. Verse 45. And Jesus said, who touched me? See, we got this backwards. We're saying, God, 
touch me and then I'll be excited for you. Instead of us touching God and he'll touch us. And so Jesus says, who touched me? And if you read that verse, his disciples said, what do you mean who touched you? There's like tons of people around you. They're all over the place. They're, they're bumping against everybody as we're going through this crowd. And you're saying, who touched you? They had no answer. But something happened to him. Here's what happened to him, verse 45. When all denied, Peter said, you know, master, the multitude's all around you, I'm pressing towards you. And you say, who touched me? And Jesus said, someone touched me. For I perceived power going out from me. In other words, the power that was in Jesus went out from Jesus to someone who touched him with his heart, even though it was a garment. It wasn't the power in the garment, it's the man in the garment. If you start worshiping the garment, you now have religion. It's the man in the garment that healed her. And when she got low, as she could be, and all of a sudden, Jesus, the power, something that he was very recognized that he carried all the time. Because when, when it went out, he noticed, and he said these words for you and I to hear, who touched me? because I felt the power go. The next verse comes along, verse number 47. And now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, fell down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she had been healed immediately. Sometimes, we're too afraid to touch God first. Most of the church is that way. They'll go to church and let God touch them, which he very seldom does. But it's the ones that go after that get touched by God. The ones that go after and touch him and you touch him with your heart. That's what she brought. God will heal you. Just a real quick thing, it's kind of funny because here you see Peter in Acts, uh, real quick, let me just throw it up for you. And if, if you may, Acts the fifth chapter, verse number 14 says, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So they brought, verse 15, the sick out of the streets and they laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow, now what I'm trying to show you, it wasn't just the healing that stayed with Jesus and died off with Jesus on the cross, but that same power now starts to go to his people, his disciples. And he says the beds and couches and at least the shadow of Peter passed by at night fell on some of them. Go ahead, you have another verse? Also the multitude gathered in the surrounding cities of Jerusalem bringing sick people to those who were tormented on clean spirits and they were all healed. The healing of Jesus goes on. You don't touch the man. Didn't have anything to do with the man. Sometimes we preach, he had such an anointing on him that Peter, that when they, his shadow fell on the people, they got healed. You've heard it said many times if you've been in church. But it wasn't the anointing on Peter. It was the Jesus in Peter. It wasn't the anointing. In fact, the very shadow had nothing. It is nothing more than an image, a mirror of the man. And God can heal through a shadow. God can heal you tonight. That's Peter, but what about Paul? Go with me to the next, in Acts 19, verse 11. 
Now, God works unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. That's so interesting. Verse number 12. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons were brought from his body to the sick. And the disease left them. And the evil spirits went out of them. Oh, my goodness. Won't you be happy if we could just get you a handkerchief of Paul or Paul's? Wouldn't you be thrilled? Wouldn't we have the multitudes in church if we just had an apron of Paul's in the church while this place would be filled with thousands of religious people looking for the power of God in a handkerchief, handkerchief or an apron? It's never been in the handkerchief or the apron. It's been in God that was in the person who had touched God first and then God touched them. Is anybody listening? And you see that even in the life of Peter. You see that in the life of Paul. God touched them after they touched God. Paul knocked off of his horse. He had been chasing after God, the wrong God, the wrong way, the right God, the wrong way. He was touching God the best he could, trying to get as close as he could with him. Knocks him off his horse and then Jesus shows up. Jesus then touches him and he becomes the greatest apostle 